Thank you so much, Sanji and uh, to Julian for inviting me here today, and so nice to see all of you. Um, so my talk today is going to be called Distancing Mechanisms, Ketamine and Taoism. Um, and I'm speaking to you today as an excited amateur of both of these things, not as any kind of uh, expert advisor. Um, but my humble stakes for this talk are to bring out some mutual illuminations between these two extremely distant practices themselves. Um, one a pharmaceutical experience, and the other a thought that comes out of China with a long history and um, multiple textual paths um, that wind out of uh, 300 BC. So I first want to give a minimal definition of ketamine. Uh, which will be heavily redundant, maybe, for many of you, and <laughs> impossible to do anyway. Uh, but uh, just for the sake of a ground-level understanding, we'll say that ketamine is a disassociative, in, often insufflated, but can also be ingested in other ways, a um, drug that has very plateau effects. Um, user experience, as you see, can wildly vary, um, often more so than many other drugs. Um, and there's lots of fascinating empirical research being done around ketamine in empirical, um, and, and sorry, in clinical settings. So many of you have heard about uh, the therapy clinics, the ketamine therapy clinics that have popped up around Toronto, and that is ketamine a nasal spray is uh, approved for use um, as uh, an antidepressant. So there's moves to make it medicine, which it already is in parts of Europe uh, and elsewhere in the world. But I'm not looking at the empirical research or the clinical setting today. What I want to do is sort of move from the senses and from central experience, um, what is called phenomenology. And so I'm more interested in how people describe their first-hand experiences of ketamine as it exists outside of the clinic or outside of these delimited spaces, these specific spaces for therapy and treatment. Um, so, you know, in the rave, very common in friends' houses, at the after party. These are some of the places where ketamine most proliferates and where the experimentation uh, is most radical. Um, and I want to move away from the therapeutics toward uh, what I want to call an ethics. So ethics being not about getting better or worse, so there's not the promise of us getting better as a therapy, but an ethos, which is the question of how do we live. So how can, how can this drug, um, in conjunction with uh, Taoism, and thinking through some of the questions of Taoism, engage our capacity to change the way we live, change our form of life. How can we be otherwise than we are in the world? Um, so I'm going to be doing some close readings from um, a Taoist text, perhaps the most, one of the most famous, called the Zhuangzi, to give us an ethical framework for how to learn ketamine, to think about how to ritualize ketamine, um, in different ways, in ways that are singular to ourselves and to our own communities. And hopefully we'll come to a place where we get to this care without attachment. Um, and I'm calling it care without attachment to say that the ego is not attached to the things of the world. It's not clinging to the way that phenomena pass through our lives, but it's taking care of things without being personally invested in these things. Because as we'll see, both ketamine and Taoism offer great subversions to this idea of the individual self or the ego to begin with. So the structure of this talk is we'll slowly lower ourselves into the cable and emerge from out of it. <laughs> um, so if you guys need a sense of the rhythm, that's going to be it. I want to first start with the ancient notion of the pharmacon um, to think about how we think about drugs. Um, and this goes all the way back to Plato and gets resurrected with uh, people like Derrida. But um, what's important here is that you know, drugs have this ambivalent capacity to be both poison and antidote. Um, let's talk about ketamine specifically. Um, as a poison, it can make you sick um, in many, multiple physiological ways. It can be uh, addictive, psychologically addictive, as any drug can be. And I've had my own struggles with habituation and addiction with ketamine myself. But it can also be an antidote, right? It can feel good, it can rewire our thought patterns, it can um, make us connect to other people and other subjectivities in the world in a way that we couldn't otherwise do. Uh, 
So even just speaking from personal experience, often the two, the poison and the antidote function can be bound up even in one experience. Uh, we're not talking about a purity of ketamine that glorifies it as a good thing, nor is it uh, simply a toxic drug. We're going to try to think about poison and antidote uh, and how they collaborate um, or uh, have tension with each other. Um, and of course, this tension is, doesn't exist just for drugs. Right? As my friend said um, once, that he felt like he was addicted to meditation. Um, and meditation will come up for us later as well, but you know, meditation, which is touted as being just intrinsically good, was something that he became dependent on to even start a day. He had to meditate for 30 minutes. But it no longer had any function other than the, the bare repetition of meditation. It became an addic addictive function. So this pharmacon logic, I think, exceeds uh, simply pharmaceutical drug and can extend to any activity that we uh, bring ourselves into. Um, so, but the third meaning of pharmacon is really interesting and I think crucial for us to think about, which is this idea of the scapegoat, um, which in Greek society was this way to condense all the evil of the society into an animal, all the evil or all the energy that's overpowering. And sacrifice that animal or exile that animal to um, get rid of all this symbolic evil that was poured into that animal. So I think that's really interesting because often with drugs we ascribe um, a very dense and heavy amount of cause and effect into the drug itself. We say, oh, it was because of the ketamine, it was because of the MDMA that I had that experience, right? And that um, I myself fall into that um, kind of way of thinking is, is that we prioritize the drug and how we think about a trip or an experience. Um, but I think what is really important to do and what I found is really helpful is to revitalize set and setting as part of our discussions, but is to think about the mindset that we, we have when we're going into the trip and to think about the physical and psychic space that we're going into with the trip. So the mindset and the physical setting as part of the coordinates of any given trip. So instead of scapegoating um, the drug by itself, it becomes this constellation of factors, this infinite constellation of factors that need you to have um, a special experience or a radical experience. Um, and uh, Julian's text, which um, some of you will be able to read after uh, the show, after the talk, um, he says this, the distance that ketamine provides for us, allows thoughts and memories to feel hyper-present, seemingly unattached to stressors, to drift in the clarity of candlelight, rather than to be blinded by the overexposure of life's noise. Ketamine, can, ketamine use can give rise to all manner of misreading and delusion, but with practice and humility, it can be potentially clarifying. Um, so, that those matters of misreading and delusion, we want to try to think about how do we how do we evade those misreadings and delusions? How do we avoid scapegoating the drug itself and start thinking about the broader context? So what I'll do now is just weave um, a continuous oral history of 10 first-hand accounts from people I've interviewed who have um, particular rituals around ketamine use um, and particularly potent intensity around ketamine. Um, and I'm just gonna speak them all in Normally, it feels like there's a limited restriction on your brain for how comfortable you are to do things and how outgoing you're willing to be. Ketamine severs that limit restrictor and that function through disorientation. It's a relatively confusing feeling in a freeing way. It makes sounds more metallic. Physically, it feels like a weird combination of light pins and needles all over. But also, you are inside of you and not like a person inside of you, which feels pretty comfortable. That makes it easier to dance. Kevin helps me to act more intentionally. For a few nights in a row, I would go to my room and put on a non-narrative documentary. I would keep doing lines of Kevin and get to a high plateau for a few hours, and all kinds of thoughts would go through my mind as I'm watching something on film, a documentary that deals with reality. 
When I thought something was important in my flow of thoughts, I would note it down. And you would think those thoughts would be stupid. But then I look back to those genuine thoughts the next day, and I still find them quite significant. I would have a clear purpose in mind as I revisited those notes. And often they would be on the topics of my own health, or a direction in life I should pursue, or a daily practice to cultivate. I think it's been shown that it can make a similar effect on the brain as meditation. So I guess what I'm doing is cheating. It feels like an ecstasy of thought and enhances the beauty of the world. When you're on drugs, there's a deadline for experience, an hour, two hours, which makes it more condensed. My first time doing ketamine, I felt a profound indifference to what It made me feel that death is a fact that you can't experience, so why should there be fear around it? Ketamine makes you gain some appreciation for having a physical form because you deprive yourself of that physical form. I did ketamine in the shower and I was astonished, looking up at my arm, that this was the same arm that I had when I was a teen boy in the same bathtub. You can be on ketamine and be in this quasi-intoxicated state when you're drunk, but if you shut up, chin into it, you can activate it, and there's a whole universe there. It feels like a supercharged meditation. I've been looking at my friend's paintings on the and feeling absolutely transported into them. If someone tells a story, I can tell that they are there with me. Same with looking at a friend's paintings. The visual space becomes so rich. Or I told my friend the story about a summer day when I sat down to meditate, and something alive came out of the glowing phosphine and eye dust. And that something alive solidified into this paper dragon, 2D paper dragon. Suddenly you have access to all these memories that are buried, or else new connections are made that feel like new memories, feel like old memories. In this case, it called back to an experimental dance piece I was part of when I was 16 called The Serpent, when I had this alchemical vision of the serpent, totally sober on a school trip to Rome. But then in this Kevin space, I've been having all these certain time visual experiences that echo that first teenage vision of this atemporal, undulating dragon, whose physical scales, reptilian and dragon scales, are also the scales of immensity. The way that a ketamine trip makes your sober life into a pebble by comparison, and then the way a DMT trip makes the ketamine trip into a pebble by comparison. In the ketamine field, you feel that the harmonic relations, that harmonic relations in music are social constructs more than anything. That any relation to any sound is equally pleasing. For example, there was a fan in the room I was in, and I felt like I had to sing with the fan in order to change the energy to something else, and to connect to the intentionality of the fan itself. And as soon as I started to sing with it, I had this big, expansive experience. The sound of the fan wasn't bad, it wasn't annoying, but it just needed to be attuned to, it couldn't be tuned out. So ketamine allows for a lot more synapses to turn on and equalizes the value of sounds that we might judge in sober moments to be noise. It turns on this satellite dish where it feels like you can hear for miles. It makes sense that John C. Lilly would combine ketamine with sensory deprivation to add buoyancy to the satellite dish that we you get the sense of being stretched into this massive thing and also being shrunk down, like the microscope and the microscope at the same time. It feels like your consciousness is shrunk down to the micro level. I've had these bacterial visions where I'm a little worm crawling through a bloodstream. One time I did the breath of fire meditation with my friends, and I felt drawn back to this toroidal vortex in ketamine that totally collapsed all sense of dimensionality all sense of epistemology. I feel like I was drawn back into space. I thought I was God, that I was manifesting our world in some way, and I had enough ego to be completely ashamed of that thought. I looked around at my friends and thought, oh, you're gods too. And I really felt the Greek myths come alive. All the demigods on Olympus who come across to this world to help the human. After that ketamine experience, myths had a more lived-in energy to me after that. How does ketamine feel? 
feels like a like a zipper over there. Sometimes in the head, sometimes out the head, sometimes in the body, sometimes out the body, sometimes in the leg, sometimes out the leg, sometimes in the arm, sometimes out the arm, sometimes in the nose, actually always in the nose. <laughs> and how does the cave hole feel? Like two and a half hours into a white road. Huma, humid, humid edges. Melody, melody, low, 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 proscenium, flat and crust. So my interview subject may have been speaking while well, <laughs> 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 So that's just some excerpt from the swirl history of Kennedy. Um, and I'm just going to draw out some of the motifs uh, that I found were very interesting, particularly interesting um, from this, these interviews that, that did. The first is this disso dissociation as a freedom from and a freedom for the body. How Kennedy suspends usual embodiments, but new relations to physical and social bodies are possible. You know, it's easier to guess when the person says. Um, that accounts that you're inhabiting a body that's like your own kind of actual projection experiences. Um, what's interesting is that sober dissociation that becomes controllable. Um, in one report, uh, one person was having dissociations completely sober when they went to the mall. But after use of ketamine, once they realized they could um, induce this state themselves through drug use, um, then they stopped having those dissociative episodes. Or else the physiological anesthetic loosens yourself from your bodily sensations and allows your mind to wander more. If you have persistent migraines or jaw pain, that very physiological effect can have this perhaps unintended spiritual effect as well. There's some interesting parallels in intersection with meditation. Arriving in meditative states that leads people to compare the two, but also to blend the two. Um, and to call things like ketamine trips, meditation, give parameters to the ketamine trips that make it feel like meditation. There's what I want to call the uh, ketamine that uh, Kate Bush running up the hill experience, it lets exchange the experience, um, you know, that, that goes beyond identification or even empathy into what feels like a co-embodiment. The ego boundary dissolution makes it possible to step into another's experience as though it was your own. Um, and it could also have to do with time, that with ketamine's anesthetic effects, your senses are living a few moments ahead of your cognition, and that lag produces the feeling of telepathy. Um, there's this beauty of surfaces, an appreciation of the qualities of the world without judgment, or with your normal senses of judgment sus suspended in that lovely story about the fan sound suddenly taking on meaning. There's many reports of a reconfigured relationship to death, often an easing of the death anxiety, lessening of the death anxiety. Um, from having intersected with death, there's a new kind of indifference to it. It's not this mystical other side anymore, but it can be touched. There's many paradoxes of experience, um, that there's a simultaneity of opposites, like I'm inside and I'm outside. I'm high above and down below. This is really intense, but I also feel really chill. So there's all, a lot of these experiences that are reversible or collapsible. When we consider them to be binary, Kevin shows them to not actually be binary, but can be simultaneous. And then certainty visions, hieroglyphic visions, and mythic figures um, coming out of some primordial uh, thought sphere, coming out of some primordial point of collective consciousness. Uh, and we'll come back to those certain conditions soon. So I just wanted to lay some of those motifs out there, and uh, before we jump into Taoism uh, and think about how these two might be uh, related or resonant. So we're not really going to get into the textual history of the book that I'm using, but it's called the Zhuangzi, and it was published around 300 BCE, people aren't exactly sure. And it's one of two cornerstone Taoist texts that had a tremendous influence on Chinese thought and politics, the whole history of interpretation and criticism. And it was used by rulers as well as peasants, so it spanned the whole spectrum of Chinese political life. 
It's also a total pleasure to read. Hilarious, strange, enigmatic, and it offers this entire critique of ideology and traditional morality um, that's really, really pleasurable and uh, quite scathing sometimes. Um, and against these postmodernist subversions of knowable, coherent selves that we know from later Western uh, philosophy, but you know, 2,000 years earlier, which is which I find really interesting. Um, and it also challenges our attachments to contemporary capitalist life um, in a way well before capitalism has even existed. And I think it's still very relevant um, to think about in, in those terms. So if any of you are interested in and uh, looking through this text, I re recommend this translation by Bruce Zipperin. It's a very good um, English translation. So, one of the parables uh, in the drama, a lot of it is told in the form of these stories, uh, these fragmentary bursts of stories, um, which are heavily allegorical. Um, in one of these parables, there's a shaman who can predict the life and death of any human being, and he comes to town. He's this glamorous superstar, pseudo mystic, right? Uh, everyone's like bowing at his feet, and they're like, wow, this guy knows the secrets of the universe because he can predict a human life and death. Um, but in this parable, Faisal is this Taoist sage who's like, nah, that's just a final show. That's not, that's not real sage or real sage -like. So he says, you know, just now I show him, the shaman, the unbegun to emerge from my source, where he, I and he both together are of acuity that is nonetheless serpentine in its twistings, admitting of no understanding of who is who or what is what. Yet this seemed to him something endlessly collapsing and scattering, something flowing away with every wave. So what Wiz is showing to the shaman is not um, the finite lives and deaths of these individual human beings, but the very formlessness, the emptiness that subtends all of existence, this nothingness that's at the basis of all existence. And that, he's making the claim that it's far more profound to an individual's life or death. So for Taoism, emptiness is fundamental, right? Um, the Drama says that in the great beginning there was nothingness, having neither being nor name. From it arose the one, a oneness that was without form. And from this formless vacuity, it, it births what we know as, know of as chi, which is life energy. But chi, even when it becomes alive, is always tethered to this nothingness, this collapsing and scattering, this flowing away with every way. Um, so when we get to the cosmology of Taoism, um, there's an indifference to death that's enfolded here, right? That there's no identity uh, that's really in consideration. He and I are both together of this vacuity that is nonetheless serpentine in its twistings. Identity becomes scrambled in this uh, primordial nothingness. And Taoism claims that we have lost touch in a way with this fundamental nothingness. We've become caught up in the trappings of identity. Um, and what's really interesting here is that this also struck me as a very interesting description of what it feels like to be in a K-hole. That ketamine at its K-hole level of dosage has these serpentine twistings of nearly nothing. Um, at the K-hole level, ketamine narrows your senses down to a pinprick. And all you see, you see this unbegun to emerge from my source, this like very first instance of any phenomena appearing at all, whether that's in sound or in sight or uh, any other sense. It's the, the first birth of something from out of that nothingness. Um, and we can contrast this to mushrooms and acid, where ego death is often accompanied by a plenitude of central experience. Um, and although your ego uh, may dim, there's still a, an array of visions that you see. Ketamine um, shuts those senses down and gives you something that's either a glimpse of this fundamental nothingness, um, or it's a hologram, a mere representation of that fundamental nothingness. 
Um, but what's important is that you don't know if you're in the drug state, if you're actually getting access to this fundamental nothingness, or if it's just an illusion, a representation of that which is unrepresentable. Um, and I think it's important to, to keep that ambivalence at play um, when we're thinking about how these two things might resonate with each other. But, you know, we're not going to devote ourselves to nothingness um, in this monastic way. We're not going to become Taoist sages who uh, live in that nothingness um, and live away from society. So how can we begin to crawl out of the cave and take something of that nothingness with us back into society, back into um, our ethical conception of our lives? Um, so in Taoist meditation, there's this long tradition called Zuo Wang, which means forgetting oneself in total absorption of the self into the object, uh, literally like oblivion seeking. And seeing and forgetting is this form of meditation uh, that has this complex history, many Taoist traditions. But it's this practical way of merging with the formless that we've just talked about. That is actually already what you are by letting yourself be absorbed by the surfaces of the world that are always transforming, that are in that serpentine flux. So a total absorption of yourself into the world means that you forget about all the crystallized things that you have, that you call identity, um, that you call ego. But instead, you're in the flow of transformation itself. Um, and it's connected with this Taoist preference uh, for mean instead of true, which mean refers to not to a deeper apprehension of the real truths lying beneath the surface of appearances, but rather to the attentiveness to the surface the most obvious and undeniable feature of which is the intrinsic inseparability and unavoidable mutual transformations of things, inhabiting and then forgetting the intrinsic rightness of each thing as it passes. So what's really being challenged here, um, and what I love so much about the story of, of the fan sound, is our judgment of what is good or bad. We're forgetting, inhabiting and then forgetting the intrinsic rightness of each thing as it passes, instead of holding on to our judgment um, instead of holding on to what our idea of music is versus noise. And we're instead of attending to the surface itself um, and not reaching with our minds into this deeper apprehension, this deeper level of apprehension, um, where we're trying to grasp the objects of the world, where we're trying to really understand and get our minds in there. Devil's mass is to pull back on that and say, what about the surfaces? Like, what does it mean to stay at the surface um, and to dissolve yourself into the sublime nature of the surface. So, um, now we move from the sensual level into the social level. Um, we've learned about the void that composes all things, that leads us to indifference toward our own death. We've learned about this kind of non-judgmental perception of surfaces, where we take each surface for what it is and how it transforms. But then what of the social and political? Um, so I'll just read uh, one last parable. Um, Khoisan said to Trump, I have a huge tree that people call the snake tree. The trunk is swollen and gnarled, impossible to align with any level or ruler. The branches are twisted and bent, impossible to align to any T-square or carpenter's arc. Even if it were growing right in the road, a carpenter would not give it so much as a second glance. And your words are similarly big but useless, which is why they are rejected by everyone who hears them. That's uh, a burn from 2,000 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but John Zen refuses to be burned. He says, you have this big tree and you worry that it is useless. How you can loaf and wander, doing a whole lot of nothing, away there at its side. How far flung and unfettered you be, dozing there beneath it. It will never be cut down by axe or saw. Nothing will harm it. Since it has nothing for which it can be used, what could it entrap or afflict it? So this parable condenses this idea of um, Taoist social uselessness really well. This tree is useless for anything except being itself. Right? It does not bend to any social function. It can't be used by a carpenter. Can be 
made into a desk or a chair. And Jonza is saying that actually this tree is a model for how we ought to behave, um, especially when we're caught up in utility value. We give ourselves over to utility value. Um, and I think now more than ever, um, he's giving this radical interpretation of Wu Wei, which means non effort, that you don't have to try to be anything for anyone, or to try to be anything to accomplish anything. So, I think this not being swept up in the utilitarian demands really resonates with me and might resonate for, for many of you because capitalism's logic gives utility uh, fundamentally in terms of the individual subject of capitalism. And what's interesting for me is that ketamine dissociates you rather forcefully from utility. You literally maybe get to a point where you can't climb a set of stairs or you can't pick up an object you can't do work, you can't labor, you can't make a thought work in its, the way that it's supposed to work or communicate a sentence in a way that's comprehensible. In the, in the place of that, you have this distance from utility or who you are as a useful person. Um, it's all jumbled into something, a new configuration. So Kevin's flow tends against the flow of capital and lets other latent flows come different creative flows come through. For example, communication is no longer about grasping the meaning, but about this inarticulable resonance, um, as you can see with the breakdown of language in the oral history of Kennedy. Um, language itself becomes disoriented and kaleidoscopically jumbled. Um, you know, so you can contrast this to, let's say, stimulant logic, the logic of stimulants, which often are tuned to the flow of capital. Um, often people use stimulants in order to maximize their utility value, to produce um, at maximum efficiency, which is totally fair. Sometimes we have to do that um, to survive and to thrive in capitalism. But the ketamine and, and uh, stimulants have this opposing sort of flow function. Um, and another point of resonance, which I find really interesting, is that the language of dissociation comes around, comes up around Taoism and draws the um, as well as the language of the dissociation coming out of um, the language of uh, people speaking about Kevin. Right? It's, um, with Taoism and the Dronza, it's all about dissociating your ego from affliction. So it's not about it's not about not feeling any pain or not or refusing all suffering, but that it's no longer necessarily your ego that's feeling that affliction. Uh, so it's not a state of comfortable numbness, nor even that you're feeling the need to be damaged but your feelings remain distant from your need to attach to them. So in the social function of uselessness and these distancing mechanisms, um, I just wanted to close by asking a few questions uh, that I've been trying to explore in community and by myself. Um, what rituals and practices, what new formations of set and setting can we construct around community to amplify its intrinsic powers? And this is without uh, demeaning the experimental uses of ketamine in wave spaces, which I've learned so much from that, and I'm sure many of you have as well. Um, but how can we also uh, try out new arrangements, uh, new rituals uh, where ketamine is used, um, but in different kinds of intentionality, right? in different constellations of intentions? Um, so that's a more practical question. And some of those rituals are, we've already seen um, meditations. Um, whether those are new meditations that you come up with for yourself or if you borrow previous meditation, but you find um, integration of artistic and social practices, like playing music together, singing in chorus, I think has been a particularly phenomenal experience for myself. Um, or even something, a ritual as simple as choosing not to speak when you're with your friend and just looking and listening and so uh, But again, I don't think we should ever stop experimenting in non-intentional and casual contexts, but this is a way to supplement uh, those experimentations. And um, finally, I'll just end with this final question. How can the powers of ketamine help us to cultivate Taoist ethics that might allow us to dissociate from ego attachments and thus make us more able to care for the world um, as it is? Great. Thank you all so much for listening.
this one instead of um, instead of a Q and A, which are such an artificial form. Um, I can't stand it. Um, <laughs> but we might do like a public forum instead, where anyone can speak. It doesn't have to be questions to me, but you're free to ask questions to me as well. Um, but I thought it might be a good time for us to have a public forum around ketamine, and uh, it's such a rare opportunity to do that. Um, and if you want to challenge or are curious about some of the paths of thought in this um, scattered talk I gave, um, please pursue those threads as well. Um, and if you feel sensitive about using your own personal experience, I like the acronym that, that Arrowhead users use, which is SWIM, someone who isn't me. <laughs> it's, like swim. Um, it's like a cute relic of the internet. Um, yeah, so I'll give everyone some time to think uh, if they want to. Maybe we'll stop the Instagram live. I don't know if people want to be on that, but thank you so much. Um, and if anyone has yeah, thoughts, um, if they want to add to the oral history, I would love that as well. I'm going to take a seat. Yes. Okay. Uh, my question is, uh, I'm a 